program today after my brief intro, Madhu Ramnath, our um, main speaker, will introduce Wild Foods as the centerpiece of our initiative. Um, through his conversational presentation coming out of his own personal and hands-on experience and years of study about wild foods. And he explores this with other related matters and issues like customary tenure, biodiversity, markets, and livelihoods. After his presentation, Dr. Ramon Razal will moderate a discussion among all of us. We invite the expert group members and all participants to give your reactions, share your insights from your own experience, and collectively for us to begin to put together a thread of understanding about wild foods and give your suggestions for further probing in our next discussion in July, in August, and September. Uh, so there will be three more discussions to which everyone again will be invited. Finally, do raise questions if you have any for Madhu and this group to shed more light about our core subject. Madhu, Dr. Ramon Razal, and myself are all part of the NTFP Exchange Program, which is a membership association of 21 members, including six affiliated country programs that has a partners network of over 100 non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations across Asia. Um, next slide. Um, particularly in the Philippines, we are present particularly in the Philippines, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So, um, and NTFP Exchange Program aims to strengthen the capacity of forest-based and indigenous communities and their support organizations on the sustainable management of natural resources and to protect and cultivate traditional ecological systems and practices. We appreciate and are very excited about this new collaboration we have with Siani, who is supporting this initiative. And Siani is a network-based communication. So uh, as I mentioned um, and have started to introduce Siani, who is our um, uh, partner and supporter for this initiative, it's a network-based communications platform dedicated to food security and agriculture development. Siani's vision is to see an end to hunger, the achievement of food security, and the improvement of nutrition, and the promotion of sustainable agriculture. Siani's mission is to facilitate inclusive and engaging dialogues such as through expert groups around uh, the sustainable development goal number two, ending hunger, with participation from multi-sector experts from the academia, private sector, public authorities, and civil society. Siani expert groups are broad-based working groups, the purpose of which is for these to convene on specific issues in order to contribute to a holistic understanding of the issues in the field. The expert groups consolidate knowledge and foster the interactions between the members of the Siani network in Sweden and internationally. The NTFP EP is one of its newer partners and the Wild Food Biodiversity Livelihood Expert Group is its newly launched group running until May or June next year. The Wild Foods Biodiversity and Livelihood Expert Group is aligned with Siani's vision. And um, as you may know, as you may well know, FAO places around 820 million worldwide that go hungry every day of which 135 million suffer from acute hunger, largely due to man-made conflicts, climate change, and economic downturns. It could now well be double that number due to the pandemic we are in the thick of and make it almost a billion suffering from hunger by end of 2020, according to the World Food Program. A prominent recommendation in global policy is to affect the global food and agriculture system in order to alleviate hunger and poverty. More often than not, however, forest and forest people situation and contribution to address global food security is given little attention in the equation of impacts as well as the solutions. But not to forget, over 1.6 billion globally are dependent on forests for food, for shelter, for income, and even on their, for their cultural survival. It seems obvious that that part of the equation is critical for us here today who are interested parties in this important equation may have a thing or two to say about this. 
To this end, our Wild Food Biodiversity Livelihood Initiative aims to, uh, number one, achieve better understanding and awareness of local wild food knowledge and rotational farming and hunting gathering systems in Asia. Second, is, um, aims to do advocacy in wild foods, rotational farming and hunting gathering systems as part of food security interventions, and to view the forest farm ecosystem as a viable livelihood option. And the third is a strategic collaboration framework on forests and forest farm ecosystems for food security, biodiversity, and livelihoods. Our project's immediate objectives are to consolidate and communicate uh, our research, field programs, and dialogue findings and learnings, to establish a knowledge sharing and media platform on the value of forests for food, biodiversity, and livelihood security, and to develop a concept, a concept note for an NTFP Academy to be a collaborative platform to affect food security, biodiversity conservation, and livelihood development in Asia. How we will do this in this year, in one year, is to, um, to start off, we're kicking it off with this online discussion series, which will run from today and then one, uh, one time at the end of July, another one in August, and another one in September. And uh, Alongside this um, would be a social media campaign and development of communication products to do an audio video collection about wild foods, biodiversity and livelihood from across uh, South and Southeast Asia. And uh, right now we, there are um, a few of our colleagues who are already doing and preparing their country situation papers uh, that will be coming from Cambodia, India, Indonesia and Vietnam. We will be producing policy briefs, consolidating also the recommendations that are coming out from the country papers as well as uh, our dialogues. And then finally, to uh, culminate this initiative with the regional policy dialogue. Um, next slide, to present to you the expert group. Firstly, we have uh, our co-authors of the new book published by the NTFP Exchange Program. Wild Tastes in Asia, Coming Home to the Forest for Food, Madhu Ramnath and Dr. Ramon Razal. Joining them are members, are members and dialogue partners from SIANI, the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, SSNC, Stockholm Resilience Center, Institute for Social Ecological Research, the Tenure Facility, Resilient Landscapes, Last Forest Enterprises, the ICCA Consortium, Southern Institute of Ecology, Bagakenyao Association for Sustainable Development from Thailand, the Cambodia Indigenous Peoples Alliance and Indigenous Women Working Group, the NTFP Exchange Program itself and the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. We are still inviting in the process a few more dialogue partners, particularly policy institutions and stakeholders on food security, forestry and biodiversity. Finally, let me give a few more words of introduction for Madhu Ramnath, our main speaker. Madhu is the coordinator for NTFP EP India, a network of, an, of NGOs and community-based organizations in Western and Eastern Ghats and Central India. He has been immersed in the subject of barefoot ecology and wild forest foods in Asia and is learning more about traditional cultivated plants. His other related areas of interest include nutrition, health, indigenous land tenure, nurseries, and reforestation. He has authored several books, including Wood Smoke and Leaf Cups, and the latest publication, Wild Foods, Wild Tastes in Asia. Our discussion moderator, Dr. Ramon Razal, is professor and former dean of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, College of Forestry and Natural Resources, where he teaches non-timber forest products and other forest products utilization courses. He also served as the president of the National Research Council of the Philippines. Um, Dr. Razal is also a member of the Board of Trustees of NTFP Exchange Program and chairs its research committee. He is co-author and author of various publications such as The Non-Wood Forest Products of the Philippines, Wild Taste in Asia, as mentioned, and he has done research and published articles on various NTFPs such as bamboo, resins, and other chemical products from forest plants with a view to improving livelihood opportunities for forest-based communities and enhancing the policy environment for accessing and marketing non-timber forest products. 
So, without uh, further ado, Madhu, this is your cue. You're welcome to begin. Thank you very much. That's right. Hello, everybody. I'm Madhu Ramnath, and I'm honored to be able to speak to all of you, and also a little nervous seeing that all of you are experts in some related field. So I need to handle this. I'm not an expert with this PowerPoint. Go up again. Arrow up. Yeah. Yes. So can you hear me, everybody? I... Yes. Yeah, you can. OK. And okay. good morning and good afternoon. So I'm here to explore the subject of wild food and very related matters like tenure, biodiversity, uh, livelihoods, and many other things which seem to fall into place when we mention wild foods. And today I'd like to discuss, along with wild foods, uh, how we could get beyond the book which we published recently, which is The Wild Taste in Asia. Perhaps some of you have already seen it. And I'd like to begin uh, with a couple of very small stories. They are more likely anecdotes rather than stories. And the first uh, story is around wild foods and specifically yams. And I don't know if any of you recognize this picture. It is uh, one of the yams, quite a common one in India and parts of Asia. It's Dioscoria pentaphylla. Yams are mainly one genus of about 630 species, and many of them have edible tubers. Very difficult to identify, and even for botanists, and uh, in the field, many of the yams look alike, especially the vegetative parts. That's the leaves and the way they twine. So my first story concerns identification. And as I mentioned, yams are the most, one of the most difficult uh, tubers to identify, which also has food below the ground. But the identification happens above the ground. So this is about a boy with whom I used to wander in the forest looking for yams. And he was a boy who'd already been to school and spent a lot of time away. And he'd finished school. So when he returned to the village, we would often go into the forest looking for yams. And I was extremely surprised and taken, uh, you know, happily surprised that he usually knew his yams. And with this long gap, because he'd been to school, a long gap from the village, I asked him how he still remembered his yams and who taught him. And it, uh, he told me that he was carried by his mother and aunt on their hips when they went digging for yams. And that was as a very small child. And every time they did find a spot where they could dig, they would place him on a rock or under a tree and continue to work. And it is several, several journeys of this kind where he must have just sat as a small boy and watched an aunt and mother and maybe other relatives dig and pull out these yams and maybe some parts of the identification, whether the twine had prickles and which direction the twine went, how deep different yams were. Some can be up to two meters deep, and some are very close to the surface. Some spread out from the main stem. Some are right below the stem. So all these kind of observations, they become a part of what we today call traditional knowledge. And many things around 
when you talk about wild foods, there are many other related matters, as I say, uh, about harvest, about processing, about the knowledge of the terrain, where wild foods are found with respect to other plants. All these things are actually one. And how this was passed on, this knowledge, was at, at least as far as this boy is concerned, it's mainly by watching and later by doing. And this is an, a very important part of traditional knowledge, that knowledge in our mainstream society is often thought of as institution, with institutions, how we impart knowledge through lectures in classrooms, books, and how traditional knowledge, on the other hand, is something else. And so when we talk about traditional knowledge, it is something we need to keep in mind that we need to create opportunities where knowledge can be passed on and not depend on the kind of documentation we have uh, begun to depend on. So this is a lesson for us. So I wanted to mention this. And while talking about wild foods, one thing which we often miss and I wonder if anyone here knows what's going on in this photograph. Oh, you're all muted, so you can't even answer. So uh, I assume it's a difficult one. This is an oil press in a village. So oils are often left out of wild foods. We talk about aquatics, we talk about terrestrial foods, we talk about plants, we talk about small game, but oils and edible oils, very much part of rural society, tribal society. And this is an oil press just made out of contraption made of wood and the oil sort of falls into that little tin. It's something I just wanted to show that oil should be included in our discussions. Uh, especially because things like palm oil is crowding out indigenous oils, both in terms of space and in terms of an edible food. So we come to this uh, second kind of anecdote, and this uh, is related to the subtitle or the second title of our book, which is Coming Home to the Forest for Food. Coming home. And home is something which is both intimate and home is somewhere where one has the most confidence. Uh, and the forest as home, that is a person who is at home in the forest. So when and the second anecdote is also something which I recall whenever we go to the stream to bathe, mm, we know that many plants, especially those belonging to the family of uh, Tiliaceae or Malvaceae, all have shampoo-like substances under their bark. So when one goes to the stream, one doesn't need to carry soap. You just need to get a bit of such a bark and use it in lieu of soap. It is the confidence that you know your territory and you know that such a plant exists on the way to the stream, the, the intimacy with which you know your surrounding. And similarly, whenever we go uh, to cook a meal, we usually carry only the basics because something which can pep up a meal, uh, like a fish or a crab, is always available if you know how to get it and where to get it. So that is what I'm, we meant, I think, by coming home to the forest for food. And uh, so the next slide sort of is a kind of symbol of that intimacy and that confidence. Uh, this is a picture from Sarawak. And there's a grandmother and a lot of young children. And there is that complete abandon, that intimacy, that confidence with which such people will grow up because they have this guardianship of a grandmother. So this is something I just wanted to share. And words like confidence, intimacy, uh, are intangible words. And these are the words which 
are as important as nutritive value, uh, you know, biodiversity, all these quantifiable factors which we deal with when we talk about wild foods. Uh, these are the intangibles which are as important. So what are wild foods? I was expecting that there will be a definition uh, which we had worked out uh, in NTFP Asia, but as it hasn't come, I think I'll let the definition, which is very much a definition, uh, we'll keep it aside. But what usually used to come to my mind when I talked about wild foods was something not consciously planted domesticated. And even when I say that, there is a lot of uh, gray between the wild, the semi-wild and the semi-domesticated. So when, because when we talk about say a harvest protocol, that is I will dig a tuber or I will harvest a plant in a certain way, I am already intervening with the with the hope that I will keep it sustained. That is, I will place a part of the tuber back. So I'm already intervening as if I am a farmer. So the wild is already becoming semi-wild. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of interventions where which uh, make these distinctions very difficult to make. And over years, over the last 10,000 years, we have introduced many, many wild species into cultivation. And today, some come in and some go out of our gardens, of our fields, of our homesteads. So that the, the, wild, the wild foods as something is difficult to define, but we will try defining it. And what is that wild thing in this wild food? That's the next question. And in India, we've had often a negative connotation about wild food. Uh, in Hindi, I would say jangli khana, jungle from forest food. And uh, some time ago, there was a, you know, it's usually taken as a scarcity food, something you eat only when you starve, something, it's also called famine food. It's something ha having a negative connotation. And some time ago when a particular newspaper report came up about certain people eating tubers, wild foods, the local government went into a panic of embarrassment. They came down to put out, put out the fire as if it's an absurd thing to be happening in your country. People were eating wild food. And so that is one connotation. And the other one, the macho connotation, the very manly thing about wild food is very much part of Europe. And in Europe, especially in Amsterdam, there are these wild, will the eaten. So you have these restaurants where you can eat these wild meat. And uh, for the show of it, you end up biting into the bullet. Uh, the hair is shot or whatever animal is shot. And the bullet is perhaps uh, purposefully left in the meat so that it proves that it is wild. So that is another idea of wild food. Sorry. And I continue. So and uh, the wild also resonates with non-open uh, open spaces, unbuilt spaces. But wild food, especially when it is from the forest, it uh, includes a whole range of factors. You need to know where it is, how it is harvested, the type of harvest processing. Many wild foods have toxic components. Wild foods also have what is known as phytotoxins, which prevent them from being predated. That is the wild boar hesitates before it bites into it. So there is a toxin which keeps other predators away. And these toxins need to be neutralized. A very common way of neutralizing uh, such foods, especially uh, food from the family of aroids like taro, wild taro, or even the... Hello. Hello. It is by 
adding tamarin, a souring agent, which breaks down certain crystals in these toxic components, and the method of cooking, which is straining, repeated straining, smoking. So when you talk about wild food, there is a whole lot of things we have to do. Not too many wild foods can be eaten totally without processing. Yes, and so we have to, uh, so about the wild and wild food, continuing it. The third point is something we have dealt with again with NTFPs in general. That is, uh, uh, what are NTFPs? Can certain spices which are now cultivated still be termed NTFPs? Is coffee an NTFP which is in some countries still a forest product? Uh, so the cultivation and the collection, where it is collected from and uh, whether it has fallen into cultivation. So it can be the same product, but in different parts of the world, it may be cultivated or not. In some parts still can treat it like an NTF. Did I do? Oh. I do. I so these questions have come up in NTFP discussions and they recur now with wild food. And now to come to a very uh, crucial thing which has been left out. Uh, very often when I've traveled in villages, in tribal villages, uh, and we have discussions about foods found in the forest, and we can quickly make long lists that so many foods are found in our uh, very near vicinity. But when you actually see how many are eaten, they are very few. So they're available, but not eaten. And the most important reason for that is time. Many urban youth today don't have time. And time is a crucial factor in wild food. You have to walk long. You have to make your trap, set your trap. <coughs> for some kinds of food, especially nocturnal game, you need to spend the night out. And this is the cost. I mean, it's not factored in usually. And discussions about wild food has sort of been confined to the health value and positive uh, nutritive, uh, nutritive values and how they cure certain illnesses. But time is not part of the discussion. And I think in our work, uh, when we talk about rotational farming systems and wild foods, time is of essence. And I think this is slower than slow food, if I might say that. So slow food has been a big deal today, but not wild food, even though it's slower than that. So we could bring that back into the picture. <clears throat> and now we talked about landscapes, where it is cultivated. I mean, what kind of places it's cultivated from, uh, wild foods. So this is a landscape which is completely man-made, totally. Uh, there is a light green grove with the back, which is, <clears throat> it's a tamarind grove. And then the dark green is a dipterocarp. It's a shorea robusta sal grove. Then a lighter green in the foreground is an eucalyptus plantation, then we have a maize patch, and then fallow, a rice field fallow. These are all monocrops. <coughs> but even in such space, spaces, we might be able to find uncultivated wild foods. So the word I'm also using easily substitutable is uncultivated food. And so wild foods in cultivated spaces <clears throat> is one of the uh, points I'm trying to make that wild foods are found in all landscapes, in forests, edges of cultivated spaces, even within cultivated spaces, especially like rice fields, where we find a lot of aquatics, like such a rice field. It's a place where in India and Southeast Asia, you could if it's not chemically cultivated rice, find up to 80 uh, different kinds of species of just fish, crab, snails, eels, 
various kind of aquatic plants uh, through the monsoon, especially. The monsoon also happens to be one of the richest periods for wild food collection because of the aquatics and because of many of the animals which sprout only during that time, especially the aroids, the wetland uh, species. So the monsoon is a healthy time for wild food collectors. And also after a long summer, when the green component of foods has gone low and many of our rural communities have night blindness, lack of vitamin A, suddenly in the monsoon, they pep up again with, with uh, the, without even knowing they see better because of such collections. Uh, so now we come to the kind of depressing part of it, the problems uh, surrounding wild food and here the other issues relating to wild food uh, are here listed. A very pressing one today is uh, tenure, traditional knowledge and how it's passed down with all the urbanization going on. In India, for example, the government policy is to push for urbanization so that we can get to 50 to 75 percent of our country will be urban. So the market, whether we like it or not, is there all around us and deforestation for whatever reason, whether it's a dam or mine, uh, it's always there for plantations and chemical inputs when we get into certain kinds of monoculture. So we have, we might have availability, the big word here, but not accessibility. So that's the tenure problem. And we might have availability and lack of skill, which prevents consumption. So these three words of availability, access and consumption are all related. And these other factors like tenure and knowledge and everything, sometimes you just don't have the skill anymore because skill hasn't been passed on. And so consumption is not happening, even though the food is available. So these things can be kind of triangulated and we need all for wild food consumption, sustainability to happen. So we'll take each of these in turn briefly. So the first one is tenure. So as I said, if the tenure is secure, then there is food security and recognized commons, village forests. And as in uh, the Philippines, we have the ancestral domain claims and in India, the Forest Rights Act. Uh, in some of our countries where we work with, we do have some kind of policy allowing for indigenous people to claim lands and certain kind of management policies. In India, with our Forest Rights Act, an attempt is also to make a community-based management plan, which puts food as focus. We can have food spaces <clears throat> where aquatics are threatened or where small game abound. So management plans can be food focused and help towards food security. And all this will hopefully finally lead to the SDG two. And another uh, network we have been uh, linked to the ICCA network consortium to use their model as a tenure security strategy. And then we can even talk about food within that. Uh, the last point is something which is happening in India. I don't know about other countries, but uh, a spurt of reserved uh, areas, in national parks, which cut out access to rural tribal people, which means lack of food, even though it's available on the other side of the fence and one is not allowed to access it. So this is a trend which is around tenure and it affects wild food. The next point was uh, traditional knowledge. And uh, when one visits tribal villages, rural areas today, you do uh, find that the youth doubt the relevance of the knowledge they already have. 
there is a thing of what is the point of knowing all these trees and what is the point of knowing all the fish I'm telling you about? And how can we reconfirm that uh, the validity, the usefulness of such knowledge? And I think that task is upon us because the knowledge is there, but they themselves don't have the confidence in the, uh, of that being relevant because of the second point, which is this urban influence, which has come in and uh, people need to know <clears throat> much more about how the city works, how the phone works. And today we expect a lot from our rural people and our tribal people. They have to hold on to their traditional knowledge. They also have to know the computer. They also have to know too many things, keep their hair long, for instance, and wear this and wear, keep their clothes too. So this uh, multiple pressure on the tribal and indigenous people and the rural folk to keep their culture as well as learn mainstream ways, tricks to get on with the world. And it becomes the, the burden that I think is on people like uh, the development sector, the ones we uh, belong to, to rejuvenate that knowledge, that confidence. Uh, it's a big task and not an easy one. And the market, I always think is a double-edged kind of weapon. On the one hand, for example, with wild foods, we want to promote the consumption. And on the other hand, we are also worried about the overharvest. So uh, many foods are also discovered by the market, especially the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, how does one control it? And we with NTFP, uh, uh, India and Asia, we are working on harvest protocols. And can the market use harvest protocols? In India, my experience hasn't been very positive, but it's one of the ways because you can't only expect uh, the people who harvest, the indigenous people to deal with harvest protocols, whereas the companies don't. So, uh, as I said, it's a two-way street, the market. And the other generic problems, deforestation, hydropower projects, mining, and now with the COVID, India is full of clearances. Everything is cleared because there is no parliamentary debate. There is no opposition to any project. So we are going through a phase of clearances. So these problems are all linked to wild foods. <clears throat> and it is quite strange that none of the campaigns against deforestation or mining has ever put food in the center has never talked about, because we will lose our wild food, you will not mine. They have never said it. They only said you will not mine because people are being displaced or something, but uh, food has not been the center of any of these large problems. And just to give a large picture, uh, I mean, in the beginning, everything was wild food uh, 10,000 years ago. And since then we've been cultivating and all that. And this cultivation, uh, the large statistics is from FAO records and the IUCN. Uh, the 6,000 plants cultivate for, as cultivated for food, of which only 200 are the global food output. And of this 200, nine of them account for 66 percent of the production in terms of weight. So it brings down so much of the potential we have in terms of food and space, because these nine also demand space. All of them are monocultures. And this is an IUCN statistic, I think, 24% of the wild foods recorded are, of the 4,000 are decreasing. The last one, uh, that in an average village I encounter in India, a quick uh, inventory usually leads between 300 to 500. And these, okay. uh, these are 
so the related aspects uh, of uh, wild food one will be biodiversity and the other is uh, livelihoods uh, the ones which we will take up in the coming up uh, webinars coming up the following months uh, but i just wanted to add a few points one is just like in traditional farming systems rotational farming systems uh, multiple crops adds to crop security similarly as i said the more biodiverse the area and the more you have an opportunity for plant animal aquatics and insects the more potential for wild foods and their sustainability <coughs> And as we saw, monocultures yield very little wild foods. The last one, because I'm very interested in languages, I find that as languages are shrinking, the, there is a parallel between the shrinking of biodiversity and the shrinking of world languages. It is something which Darwin remarked very, very long ago. There is a parallel in the way the languages are structured and the families of languages and biodiversity and plants. <clears throat> uh, the related, another related one for the coming up, uh, upcoming summer webinar is uh, livelihoods, and the second one being the opportunity and a threat, because there are already many wild foods which have been traditionally traded, sold, especially wild meat, fish, bamboo shoots, honey, honey perhaps the oldest. Uh, so the threat is very obvious of over harvesting, uh, but the opportunity is where we can move in if protocols are established in communities which trade in them, deal with them and link them to the market. And the other opportunity is around cultivation. The part of cultivation may be debatable, but which can be taken up when we come to discussion. But many things have been cultivated, many plants at least. So some of the points for discussion. Uh, this is more something I flag. It's not something I am going to lead. Dr. Rezal will lead this part. And about why many wild foods have not yet been cultivated uh, over, over historically too, uh, when plants fell into agriculture, uh, one of the plant uh, historians, Alphonse de Candole, had talked about how few plants have come into cultivation over all these uh, thousands of years. And the links between wild foods and traditional farming, rotational systems, because rotational farming systems also allow for wild foods to exist within and around uh, the farming, the farms. And there is a very little clear line between the two systems of two food systems, I would say. Uh, and there is, a, it's a huge scope for research and I'm happy we've already embarked on it through this new project. Uh, and the other things are questions again, whether one is more concerned or conserved and less threatened, wild foods or non-wild foods. And uh, the other one I mentioned where the conservation can think of food with a focus. And the last one, uh, the governments can make a mess of it too. So uh, in India, I would dread the government taking over wild foods, but well, it's an open question. And I think that's about it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I was clear. Now over to Dr. Azad.